10. I texted Daisy the next morning while I was still in bed. Big news call when you can. She called immediately. Hey, I said. I know he is a gigantic baby, she responded, but I actually think upon close examination he is hot. And in general, quite charming, and very sexually open and comfortable, although we didn't do it or anything. I'm thrilled for you, so last night. And he really seemed to like me? Usually I feel like boys are a bit afraid of me, but he wasn't. He holds you and you feel held, you know what I'm saying? Also he's already called me this morning, which I found cute instead of worrisomely overeager. But please do not think I am becoming the best friend who falls in love and ditches her bitches. Wait, oh god, I just said I'm in love. We've been hooking up for under 24 hours and I'm dropping L-bombs. What is happening to me? Why is this boy I've known since 8th grade suddenly so amazing? Because you read too much romantic fan fiction? There is literally no such thing, she answered. How's Davis? That's what I want to talk about. Can we meet somewhere? It's better if I can show you. I wanted to see her face when she saw the money. I already have a breakfast date, unfortunately. I thought you weren't ditching your bitches, I said. And I'm not. My breakfast date is with Mr. Charles Cheese. Alas. Can it wait till Monday? Not really, I said. Okay. I get off work at 6. Applebee's. Might have to multitask, though, because I'm trying to finish a story. Don't take it personally okay he's calling I have to go thanks love you bye. As I put down my phone, I noticed mom standing in my doorway. Everything okay? She asked. Holy helicopter parenting, mom. How was your date with that boy? Which boy? There are so many. I have a spreadsheet just to keep track of them. To kill time that morning, I went through No's file of entries from his dad's notes app. It was a long, seemingly random list. Everything from book titles to quotes. Over time, markets will always seek to become more free. Experiential value. Floor 5 Stairway 1. Disgrace, Kutsi. It went on like that for pages, just little memos to himself that were inscrutable to anyone else. But the last four notes in the documents interested me. Maldives Kosovo Cambodia. Never tell our business to strangers. Unless you leave a leg behind. The jogger's mouth. It was impossible to know when those notes had been written, and whether they'd all been written at once, but they certainly seemed connected. A quick search told me that Kosovo, Cambodia, and the Maldives were all nations that had no extradition treaty with the United States, meaning that Pickett might be allowed to stay in them without having to face criminal charges at home. Never Tell Our Business to Strangers was a memoir by a woman whose father lived on the run from the law. The top search result for, unless you leave a leg behind, was a news article called, How White Collar Fugitives Survive on the Lamb. The quote in question referred to how difficult it is to fake your own death. The jogger's mouth, made no sense to me, and searching turned up nothing except for a bunch of people jogging with their mouths open. But of course we all put ridiculous things in our notes apps that only make sense to us. That's what notes are for. Maybe he'd just seen a jogger with an interesting mouth. I felt bad for Noah, but eventually I set the list aside. Harold and I made it to Applebee's half an hour early that afternoon. 
For some reason, I was scared to actually get out of the car, but if you pulled down the center segment of Harold's back seat, you could reach directly into the trunk. So I wiggled my way back there and fumbled around until I'd found the tote bag with the money, my dad's phone, and its car charger. I stuffed the bag under the passenger seat, plugged in my dad's phone, and waited for it to charge enough to turn on. Years ago, mom had backed up all dad's pictures and emails onto a computer and multiple hard drives, but I liked swiping through them on his phone, partly because that's how I'd always looked at them, but mostly because there was something magical about it being his phone, which still worked eight years after his body stopped working. The screen lit up and then loaded the home screen, a picture of my mom and me at Juan Solomon Park, seven-year-old me on a playground swing, leaning so far back that my upside-down face was turned to the camera. Mom always said I remembered the pictures, not what was actually happening when they were taken, but still, I felt like I could remember, him pushing me on the swing, his hand as big as my back, the certainty that swinging away from him also meant swinging back to him. I tapped over to his photos. He'd taken most of the pictures himself, so you rarely see him. Instead, you see what he saw, what looked interesting to him, which was mostly me, mom, and the sky broken up by tree branches. I swiped right, watching us all get younger. Mom riding a tiny tricycle with tiny me on her shoulders, me eating breakfast with cinnamon sugar plastered all over my face. The only pictures he appeared in were selfies, but phones back then didn't have front-facing cameras, so he had to guess at the framing. The pictures were inevitably crooked, part of us out of the frame, but you could always see me at least, curling into mom. I was a mama's girl. She looked so young in those pictures, her skin taut, her face thin. He'd often take five or six pictures at once in the hopes of getting one right. And if you swiped through them like a flipbook, mom's smile got bigger and smaller, my squirming six-year-old self moved this way or that, but dad's face never changed. When he fell, his headphones were still playing music. I do remember that. He was listening to some old soul song, and it was coming out of his earbuds loud, his body on its side. He was just lying there, the lawnmower stopped not far from the one tree in our front yard. Mom told me to call 911, and I did. I told the operator my dad had fallen. She asked if he was breathing, and I asked Mom, and she said no, and the whole time this totally incongruous soul song was crooning tinnily through his earbuds. Mom kept doing CPR on him until the ambulance came. He was dead the whole time, but we didn't know. We didn't know for sure until a doctor opened the door to the windowless hospital, family room, where we were waiting, and said, Did your husband have a heart condition? Past tense. My favorite pictures of my dad are the few where he's out of focus, because that's how people are, really, and so I settled on one of those, a picture he'd taken of himself with a friend at a Pacers game, the basketball court behind them their features blurred. And then I told him. I told him that I lucked into some money and that I'd try to do right by it and that I missed him. I'd put the phone and charger away by the time Daisy showed up. She was walking toward Applebee's when I called to her through Harold's open window. She came over and got into the passenger seat. Can you give me a ride home after this? My dad is taking Elena to some math thing. Yeah, of course. Listen, there's a bag under your seat, I said. Don't freak out. She reached down, pulled out the bag, and opened it. Oh, fuck, she whispered. Oh my god, Holmesy, what is this? Is this real? Tears sprouted from her eyes. I'd never seen Daisy cry. Davis said it was worth it to him, 
that he'd rather give us the reward than have us snooping around. It's real? Seems to be. I guess his lawyer is going to call me tomorrow. Holmesy, this is, this is, is this $100,000? Yeah, 50 each. Do you think we can keep it? Hell yes, we can keep it. I told her about Davis calling it a rounding error, but I still worried that it might be dirty money or that I might be exploiting Davis or... But she shushed me. Holmesy. I'm so fucking done with the idea that there's nobility in turning down money. But it's like, we only got this money because we know someone. Yeah, and Davis Pickett only got his money because he knew someone, specifically his father. This is not illegal or unethical. It's awesome. She was staring out the windshield. It had started to drizzle a little. One of those cloudy days in Indiana when the sky feels very close to the ground. Out on Ditch Road, a stoplight turned yellow, then red. I'm gonna go to college, she said. And not at night. I mean, it's not enough to pay for all of college. She smiled. Yeah, I know it's not enough to pay for all of college, Professor Buzzkill. But it is $50,000, which will make college a hell of a lot easier. She turned to me and grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me. H-O-L-M-E-S-Y Be happy. We are rich. She pulled a single hundred dollar bill from one of the stacks and pocketed it. Let's have the finest meal Applebee's has to offer. At our usual table, Daisy and I shocked Holly by ordering two sodas. When she returned with our drinks, she asked Daisy, you want the Blazin Texan burger? Holly, what is your best steak? Holly, unamused as usual, answered, none of them are that good. Well, then I'll have my usual Blazin Texan burger, but I'd like to upgrade my side to onion rings. And yes, I know it's extra. Holly nodded, then turned her eyes to me. Veggie burger, I said. No cheese or mayonnaise or... I know your order, Holly said. Coupon. Not today, Holly, Daisy answered. Not today. We spent most of dinner imagining how, precisely, Daisy would retire from Chuck E. Cheese's. I want to go in tomorrow, totally normal day, and when I draw the short straw and have to get in the Chucky costume, I just walk off with it. Walk right through the doors, into my brand new car, take Chucky home, get him taxidermied, and mount him on the wall like a hunting trophy. It's so weird, putting the heads of stuff you've killed on the wall, I said. Davis's guest house was full of that stuff. Tell me about it, Daisy said. Michael and I were hooking up in the actual shadow of a stuffed moose head. By the way, thanks for walking in on us last night, perv. Sorry, I wanted to tell you that you're rich. She laughed and shook her head again in disbelief. I ran into Noah, by the way, the little brother. He asked if I knew anything about his dad and showed me this list of his notes. Here, I said, and showed her the list on my phone. His last note was, the jogger's mouth. That mean anything to you. Daisy shook her head slowly. I just feel bad for him, I said. He was crying and everything. That kid is not your problem, Daisy said. We're not in the helping billionaire orphans business, we're in the getting rich business, and business is booming. Well, 
$50,000 isn't rich, I said. I mean, it's less than half of what IU would cost, which was the state school a couple hours south of us in Bloomington. Daisy went quiet for a long time, her eyes blanked by concentration. All right, she said at last. Just did some mental math. $50,000 is, like, 5,900 hours at my job. Which is, like, 708 hour shifts, if you can even get a full shift, which usually you can't, so that's two years of working seven days a week, eight hours a day. Maybe that's not rich to you, Holmesy, but that's rich to me. Fair enough, I said. And it was all sitting in a box of Cheerios. Well, like half of it was in a box of shredded wheat. You know what makes you a solid BFF, Holmesy? That you even told me about the money. Like, I hope I am the sort of person who would go halvesies with you on a six-figure lottery situation, but to be perfectly honest, I don't trust myself. She took a bite of her burger and mostly swallowed before saying, This lawyer guy isn't going to try to take back the money, is he? I don't think so, I said. We should go to a bank, she said. Get it deposited now. Davis said we should wait to talk to the lawyer. You trust him? Yeah. I really do. Ah, Holmesy, we've both fallen in love. Me with an artist, you with a billionaire. We're finally leading the debutante lives we've always deserved. In the end, our meal cost less than $30, but we left Holly a $20 tip for putting up with us. 11. I was watching videos on my phone the next morning when the call came in. Hello? I said. Aza Holmes? This is she. This is Simon Morris. I believe you're acquainted with Davis Pickett. Hold on. I slipped on some shoes, snuck past Mom, who was watching TV in the living room while grading tests, and went outside. I walked down to the edge of our yard and sat down facing the house. Okay, hi, I said. I understand that you've received a gift from Davis. Yeah, I said. I split it with my friend, is that okay? How you handle your financial affairs is unimportant to me. Ms. Holmes, you may find that if a teenager walks into a bank with a vast array of $100 bills, the bank will generally be suspicious, so I've spoken to one of our bankers at Second Indianapolis, and they'll accept your deposit. I've set an appointment for you at 3.15 p.m. on Monday at the branch at 86th Street and College Avenue. I believe your school day ends at 2.55, so you should have adequate time to get there. How do you know? I'm thorough. Can I ask you a question? You just have, he noted dryly. So you're taking care of Pickett's affairs while he is gone? That's correct. And if Pickett shows up somewhere, then the pleasures and sorrows of his life will belong to him again. Until then, some of them fall to me. May I request that you come to your point? I'm sort of worried about Noah. Worried? He just seems really sad, and there's kind of no one there to look after him. I mean, isn't there any other family? None with whom the Pickets have a good relationship. Davis has been declared an emancipated minor by the state and is his brother's legal guardian. I don't mean a legal guardian. I mean someone who actually, you know, looks after him. Like, 
Davis isn't a parent. I mean, they're not just gonna be alone forever, are they? What if their dad is dead or something? Ms. Holmes, legal death is different from biological death. I trust that Russell is both legally and biologically living, but I know he is legally alive because Indiana law considers an individual alive until either biological evidence of their death emerges or seven years pass from the last evidence of life. So, the legal question. I don't mean legally, I said. I just mean, who's going to take care of him? But I can only answer that question legally. And the legal answer is that I administer the financial affairs, the house manager administers the home affairs, and Davis is the guardian. Your concern is admirable, Ms. Holmes, but I assure you that everything is cared for, legally. 3.15 tomorrow. Your banker's name is Josephine Jackson. Do you have any other questions of pertinence to your situation? I don't think so. Well, you have my number. Be well, Ms. Holmes. I felt fine the next day at school, until Daisy and I were on our way to the bank. I was driving, and Daisy was talking about how her most recent fic had sort of gone viral in the Star Wars fan fiction world and how she had tons of kudos on it and how she'd had to stay up all night to finish this paper on the Scarlet Letter and how she could maybe finally get some sleep now that she was retiring from Chucky. Cheeses, and I felt fine. I felt like a perfectly normal person, who was not cohabitating with a demon that forced me to think thoughts I hated thinking. And I was just feeling, like, I've been better this week. Maybe the medicine is working, when from nowhere the thought appeared. The medicine has made you complacent, and you forgot to change the band-aid this morning. I was pretty sure I had actually changed the band-aid right after waking up, just before I brushed my teeth, but the thought was insistent. I don't think you changed it. I think this is last night's band-aid. Well, it's not last night's band-aid because I definitely changed it at lunch. Did you, though? I think so. You think so? I'm pretty sure. And the wound is open. Which was true. It hadn't yet scabbed over. And you left the same band-aid on for, God, probably 37 hours by now. Just letting it fester inside that warm, moist old band-aid. I glanced down at the band-aid. It looked new. You didn't. I think I did. Are you sure? No, but that's actually progress if I'm not checking it every five minutes. Yeah, progress toward an infection. I'll do it at the bank. It's probably already too late. That's ridiculous. Once the infection is in your bloodstream, stop that makes no sense it's not even red or swollen. You know it doesn't have to be. Please just stop I will change it at the bank. You know I'm right. Did I go to the bathroom before lunch? I asked Daisy quietly. Dunno, she said. Um, you sat down after us, so I guess. But I didn't say anything about it? No, you didn't say, greetings, lunch table mates. I have just returned from the bathroom. Felt the tension between the urge to pull over and change the band aid and the certainty of Daisy thinking me crazy. Told myself I was fine, this was a malfunction in my brain. That thoughts were just thoughts, but when I glanced at the band-aid again I saw the pad was stained. I could see the stain. Blood. Or pus. Something. I pulled into an optometrist's parking lot, took off the band-aid, and looked at the wound. It was red at the edges. The band-aid had dried blood on it. 
like it hadn't been changed in some time. Holmesy, I'm sure you went to the bathroom. You always go to the bathroom. Doesn't matter now, it's infected, I said. No, it's not. You see this red. I pointed at the inflamed skin on either side of the wound. That's infection. That's a big problem. I rarely let anyone see my finger without the band-aid, but I wanted Daisy to understand. This was not like the other times. This was not irrational worry, because dried blood was unusual, even for when the callus was cracked open. It meant the band-aid had been on for way too long. This was not normal. Then again, didn't it always feel different? No, this felt different from the other difference. There was visible evidence of infection. It looks like your finger has looked every single time you've ever worried about it. I squeezed some hand sanitizer onto the cut, felt a deep, stinging burn, unwrapped a new band-aid, and wrapped it around my finger. I sat there for a while, embarrassed, wishing I were alone, but also terrified. Couldn't get the redness and the swelling out of my mind, my skin responding to the invasion of parasitic bacteria. Hated myself. Hated this. Hey, Daisy said. She put a hand on my knee. Don't let Ozza be cruel to Holmesy, okay? This was different. The sting of the hand sanitizer was gone now, which meant the bacteria were back to breeding, spreading through my finger into the bloodstream. Why did I ever crack open the callus anyway? Why couldn't I just leave it alone? Why did I have to give myself a constant, gaping open wound on, of all places, my finger? The hands are the dirtiest parts of the body. Why couldn't I pinch my earlobe or my belly or my ankle? I'd probably killed myself with sepsis because of some stupid childhood ritual that didn't even prove what I wanted it to prove because what I wanted to know was unknowable, because there was no way to be sure about anything. It'll feel better if you reapply the hand sanitizer. Just a couple more times. It was 3.12. We had to get to the bank. I took off the band-aid, applied hand sanitizer, reapplied a band-aid. It was 3.13. Daisy said, do you want me to drive? I shook my head. Started Harold up. Put him in reverse. Then back in park. Took off the band-aid, applied more hand sanitizer. It stung less this time. Maybe that means they're mostly dead. Or maybe it means they're in too deep already, that they've gotten through the skin into the blood. Just look at it one more time. Does it look like the swelling is getting better? It's only been eight minutes too soon to tell. Stop. It was 3.15. Holmesy, she said. We need to go. I can drive. I shook my head again, put the car into reverse, and this time succeeded in getting moving. I wish I understood it, she told me as I drove. Like, does it help to be reassuring or is it better to worry with you? Is there anything that makes it better? It's infected, I whispered. And I did it to myself. Like I always do. Open the callus up and now it's infected. I was that fish, infected with a parasite swimming close to the surface, trying to get myself eaten. When we finally got to the bank, I stood in the back while Daisy introduced herself to a teller, and then we were escorted to a glassed-off private office in the back, 
where a thin woman in a black suit placed our cash into a machine that shuffled through the bills, counting them. We filled out a bunch of forms and then had brand new bank accounts, complete with debit cards that would arrive in 7 to 10 days. The woman gave us five temporary checks to use until our real ones arrived, encouraged us not to make any major purchases for at least six months, while you learn to live with this windfall, and then started talking about the places we could put the money, college savings accounts or mutual funds or bonds or stocks, and I was trying to pay attention to her, but the problem was I wasn't really in the bank. I was inside my head, the torrent of thoughts screaming that I had sealed my fate by not changing the band aid for over a day, that it was too late, and now I could feel the heat and soreness in my fingertip, and you know it's real once you can physically feel it, because the senses can't lie. Or can they? I thought, it's happening, the it too terrifying and vast to name with anything but a pronoun. Driving to Daisy's apartment complex, I kept forgetting why I was stopped at a stoplight, and then I'd let off Harold's brake only to look up and notice, oh, right. The light is red. You hear a lot about the benefits of insanity or whatever, like, Dr. Karen Singh had once told me this Edgar Allan Poe quote, the question is not yet settled, whether madness is or is not the loftiest intelligence. I guess she was trying to make me feel better, but I find mental disorders to be vastly overrated. Madness, in my admittedly limited experience, is accompanied by no superpowers, being mentally unwell doesn't make you loftily intelligent any more than having the flu does. So I know I should have been a brilliant detective or whatever, but in actuality I was one of the least observant people I'd ever met. I was aware of absolutely nothing outside myself on the drive to Daisy's apartment building and then to my house. I went to the bathroom when I got home and examined the cut. The swelling seemed down. Maybe. Maybe the light in the bathroom just wasn't strong enough for me to see clearly. I cleaned it with soap and water patted it dry, applied hand sanitizer, and then rebandaged my finger. I also took my regular medication, and then a few minutes later an oblong white pill I'd been told to use when panicky. I let the pill melt on my tongue into a vague sweetness and waited for it to kick in. I felt certain something was going to kill me, and of course I was right. Something is going to kill you, someday, and you can't know if this is the day. After a while, my head got heavy, and I sat down on the couch in front of the TV. I didn't really have the energy to turn it on, so I just stared at the blank screen. The oblong pill made me feel exceptionally groggy, but only from the bridge of my nose up. My body felt like its standard self, broken and insufficient in the usual ways, but my brain felt sloppy and exhausted like the noodle legs of a runner post-marathon. Mom came home and plopped down next to me. Long day, she said. I don't mind students, Aza. It's the parents that make my job hard. Sorry, I said. How was your day? Okay, I said. I don't have a fever, do I? She pressed the back of her hand to my forehead. I don't think so. Do you feel sick? Just tired, I think. Mom turned on the TV, and I told her I was going to lie down and do some homework. I read my history textbook for a while, but my consciousness felt like a camera with a dirty lens, so I decided to text Davis. Me. Hi. Him. Hi. Me. How are you? Him. Pretty good, you? Me. Pretty good. Him. Let's continue this awkward silence in person. Me. When? Him. There is a meteor shower Thursday night.
Should be a good one if it's not cloudy. Me. Sounds great. See you then. I have to go my mom is here. She had, in fact, peeked her head in through the door. What's up? I asked. Want to make dinner together? I need to read. She came in, sat down on the edge of my bed, and said, You feeling scared? Kinda. Of what? It's not like that. The sentence doesn't have, like, an object. I'm just scared. I don't know what to say, Aza. I see the pain on your face and I want to take it from you. I hated hurting her. I hated making her feel helpless. I hated it. She was running her fingers through my hair. You're all right, she said. You're all right. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I felt myself stiffen a little as she kept playing with my hair. Maybe you just need a good night's sleep, she said at last, the same lie I'd fed to Noah. 12. The morning of the meteor shower, I arrived at school with Harold and discovered a bright orange Volkswagen Beetle parked in my usual spot. As I pulled in next to the car, I saw that Daisy was in the driver's seat. I rolled down my window and said, Didn't Josephine the banker tell us not to make any purchases for six months? I know, I know, she said. But I talked the car sales dude down to $8,400 from $10,000, so in a way I actually saved money. You know what the color's called. She snapped. Snap orange. Because it's snappy. Don't waste the money, okay? Don't worry, Holmesy. This car is only going to appreciate in value. Liam is a future collector's item. I've named him Liam, by the way. I smiled. It was an inside joke that literally no one else would get. As we walked across the parking lot, Daisy handed me a thick book, Fisk Guide to Colleges. I also picked this up, but it turns out I don't need it because I'm definitely going to IU. I always knew that college was expensive, but some of these places cost almost a hundred grand per year. What do they do there? Are the classes on yachts? Do you get to live in a castle and get served by house elves? Even rich me can't afford fancy college. Certainly not if you're buying cars, I wanted to say, but instead I asked her about the picket disappearance. You ever figure out what the jogger's mouth was? Holmesy, she said. We got the reward. It's over. Right, I know, I said, and before I could say anything else. She spotted Michael across the parking lot and ran off to hug him. All morning, I lost myself in Daisy's college book. Every now and again, a bell would sound, and I'd move to a different room, sitting at a different desk, and then I'd go back to reading the college guide, holding it on my lap under the desk. I'd never really thought about going to college anywhere but Indiana University or Purdue, my mom had gone to Indiana and my dad to Purdue, and they were both cheap compared with going to school out of state. But reading through the hundreds of colleges in this book, which were rated on everything from academics to cafeteria quality, I couldn't help but imagine myself at some small college somewhere on a hilltop in the middle of nowhere with 200-year-old buildings. I read about one school where you could use the same library study Carl that Alice Walker had. Admittedly, 50000 would hardly make a dent in the tuition, but maybe I could get a scholarship. My grades were good, and I was a competent standardized test taker. I let myself imagine it, taking classes like politicized geography and 19th century British women in literature in small classrooms, everyone seated in a circle. I imagined the crunch of gravel paths under my feet as I walked from class to the library 
where I'd study with friends, and then before dinner at a cafeteria that served everything from cereal to sushi, we'd stop at the college coffee shop and talk about philosophy or power systems or whatever you talk about in college. It was so fun to imagine the possibilities, West Coast or East Coast. City or country. I felt like I might end up anywhere, and imagining all the futures I might have, all the asses I might become, was a glorious and welcome vacation from living with the me I currently was. I broke away from the college guide only for lunch. Across the table from me, Michael was working on a new art project meticulously tracing the waveforms of some song onto a sheet of thin, translucent paper, while Daisy regaled our lunch table with the story of her car purchase, without ever quite revealing how she came across the necessary funds. After I'd eaten a few bites of my sandwich, I took out my phone and texted Davis. What time tonight? Him. Looks like it's going to be overcast tonight so no meteor shower. Me. My primary interest is not the meteor shower. Him. Oh. Then after school? Me. I've got a homework date with Daisy. Seven? Him. Seven works. After school, Daisy and I locked ourselves in my room to study for a couple hours. It's only been three days since I retired from Chuck E. Cheese. But it's already shocking how much easier school is, she said as she unzipped her backpack. She pulled out a brand new laptop and set it up on my desk. Jesus, Daisy, don't spend it all at once, I said quietly, so mom wouldn't hear. Daisy shot me a look. What? You already had a car and a computer, she said. I'm just saying you don't want to spend all of it. She rolled her eyes a little, and I said what again, but she disappeared into her online world. I could see her screen from the bed. She was scrolling through comments on her stories as I read one of Alexander Hamilton's Federalist essays for history. I kept reading the words but not understanding them, then circling back, reading the same paragraph over and over again. Daisy was quiet for a few minutes, but at last said, I try really hard not to judge you, Holmesy, and it's slightly infuriating when you judge me. I'm not judging. I know you think you're poor or whatever, but you know nothing about being actually poor. Okay, I'll shut up about it, I said. You're so stuck in your head, she continued. It's like you genuinely can't think about anyone else. I felt like I was getting smaller. I'm sorry, Holmesy, I shouldn't say that. It's just frustrating sometimes. When I didn't respond, she kept talking. I don't mean that you're a bad friend or anything. But you're slightly tortured, and the way you're tortured is sometimes also painful for, like, everyone around you. Message received, I said. I don't mean to sound like a bitch. You don't, I said. Do you know what I mean, though? She asked. Yeah, I said. We studied together quietly for another hour before she said she needed to leave for dinner with her parents. When she got up to leave, we both said, I'm sorry, at the same time, then laughed. By the time Davis texted me at 6.52, I had mostly forgotten about it. Him. I'm in your driveway should I come in? Me. No 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 nope no I will be out shortly. Mom was emptying the dishwasher. Headed out to dinner, I told her, and then grabbed my coat and got out the door before she could inquire further. Hi, he said as I climbed into his car. Hi back, I said. Have you eaten? He asked. I'm not really hungry, but we can get food somewhere if you are, I said. I'm good, he said, backing up. I actually kind of hate eating. I've always had a nervous stomach. Me too, I said, 
and then my phone started ringing. It's my mom. Don't say anything. I tapped to answer. Hey. Tell the driver of that black SUV to turn around this instant and come back to our house. Mom. This isn't going further without me meeting him. You have met him. When we were 11. I am your mother, and he is your, whatever he is, and I want to talk to him. Fine, I said, and hung up. We, uh, need to go into the house if that's okay, and meet my mom. Cool. Something in his voice reminded me that his mom was dead, and I thought about how everyone always seemed slightly uncomfortable when discussing their fathers in front of me. They always seemed worried I'd be reminded of my fatherlessness, as if I could somehow forget. I never realized how small my house was until I saw Davis seeing it, the linoleum in the kitchen rolling up in the corners, the little settling cracks in the walls, all our furniture older than I was, the mismatched bookshelves. Davis looked huge and misplaced in our house. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen a guy inside this room. He wasn't quite six feet tall, but somehow his presence made the ceiling seem low. I felt embarrassed of our dusty old books and the walls decorated with family photos instead of art. I knew I shouldn't be ashamed, but I was anyway. It's nice to see you, Ms. Holmes, Davis said, offering a handshake. My mom hugged him. We all sat down at our kitchen table, which almost never had more than two people at it, mom and me. It seemed over full. How are you, Davis? She asked. Things are good. As you may have heard, I am kind of an orphan, but I am well. How are you? Who looks after you these days? She asked. Well, everybody and nobody, I guess, he said. I mean, we have a house manager, and there's a lawyer guy who does the money stuff. You're a junior at Aspen Hall, yes. I closed my eyes and tried to telepathically beg my mother not to attack him. Yes. Aza is not some girl from the other side of the river. Mom, I said. And I know you can have anything the moment you want it, and that can make a person think the world belongs to them, that people belong to them. But I hope you understand you are not entitled to. Mom, I said again. I shot Davis an apologetic look, but he didn't see, because he was looking at my mom. He started to say something, but then had to stop, because his eyes were welling up with tears. Davis, are you all right? My mom asked. He tried to speak again but it devolved into a choked sob. Davis, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Blushing, he said, I'm sorry. Mom started to reach a hand across the table, but then stopped herself. I just want you to be good to my daughter, she said. There's only one of her. We have to get going, I announced. Mom and Davis continued their staring contest, but Mom finally said, back by 11, and I grabbed Davis by the forearm and pulled him out the front door shooting mom a look as I went. Are you okay? I asked as soon as we were safely inside his Escalade. Yeah, he said quietly. She's just really overprotective. I get it, he said. You don't need to be embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. Then what are you? It's complicated. I've got time, I told him. She's wrong that I can have anything I want whenever I want it. What do you want that you don't have? I asked. A mother, for starters. He put the car into reverse and backed out of the driveway. I wasn't sure what to say, so eventually I just said, sorry. 
You know that part of Yeats's The Second Coming, where it's like the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Yeah, we read it in AP. I think it's actually worse to lack all conviction. Because then you just go along, you know? You're just a bubble on the tide of empire. That's a good line. Stole it from Robert Penn Warren, he said. My good lines are always stolen. I lack all conviction. We drove across the river. Looking down, I could see Pirate's Island. Your mom gives a shit, you know? Most adults are just hollowed out. You watch them try to fill themselves up with booze or money or God or fame or whatever they worship, and it all rots them from the inside until nothing is left but the money or booze or God they thought would save them. That's what my dad is like. He really disappeared a long time ago, which is maybe why it didn't bother me much. I wish he were here, but I've wished that for a long time. Adults think they're wielding power, but really power is wielding them. The parasite believes itself to be the host, I said. Yeah, he said. Yeah. As we walked up to the picket house, I could see two place settings at one corner of Davis's huge dining room table. A candle flickered between the settings, and the first floor of the house was lit a soft gold. My stomach was all turned around, and I had no desire to eat, but I followed him in. I guess Rosa made us dinner, he said to me. So we should at least have a few bites to be polite. Hi, Rosa, he said. Thanks for staying late. She pulled him into a big bear hug. I made spaghetti. Vegetarian. You didn't need to do this, he said. My children are grown-ups, so you and Noah are the only little boys I have left. And when you tell me you have a date with your new girlfriend? Not girlfriend, Davis said. Old friend. Old friends make the best girlfriends. You eat. I'll see you tomorrow. She pulled him down into another hug and kissed him on the cheek. Take something up to Noah so he doesn't starve, Rosa added, and do your dishes. It's not too hard to wipe dishes clean and put them in a dishwasher, Davis. Got it, he said. Your life is so weird, I said as we sat down to eat at the table set for two, with a drive pepper in front of my spot and a Mountain Dew in front of his. I guess, he said. He raised his can of soda. To weird, he said. To weird. We clinked cans and sipped. She acts like a parent, I said. Yeah, well, she's known me since I was a baby. And she cares about us. But she also gets paid to care about us, you know. And if she didn't? I mean, she'd have to find a different job. Yeah, I said. It seemed to me that one of the defining features of parents is that they don't get paid to love you. He asked me about my school day, and I told him I'd had a fight with Daisy. I asked about his day at school, and he said, it was okay. There's this rumor at school that I killed not only my dad, but also my mom. So. I don't know. I shouldn't let it get to me. That would get to anyone. I can take it, but I worry about Noah. How was Noah? He climbed into bed with me last night and just cried. I felt so bad I loaned him my Iron Man. I'm sorry, I said. He's just. I guess at some point. You realize that whoever takes care of you is just a person, and that they have no superpowers and can't actually protect you from getting hurt. Which is one thing. But Noah is starting to understand that maybe the person he thought was a superhero turns out sort of to be the villain. And that really sucks.
He keeps thinking Dad is going to come home and prove his innocence, and I don't know how to tell him that. You know, Dad isn't innocent. Does the phrase, the jogger's mouth, mean anything to you? No, but the cops asked me that, too. Said it was in Dad's phone. Yeah. I mean, my father is many things, but a jogger is not one of them. He thinks exercise is irrelevant, because Tua is going to unlock the key to eternal life. Seriously? Yeah, he believes Malik is going to be able to identify some factor in Tuatara blood that makes them age slowly, and then he's going to cure death, Davis said, using air quotes. That's why his will leaves everything to Tua, he thinks he's going to be remembered as the man who ended death. I asked him if Tua would really get all of his dad's money, and he laughed a little and said, everything. The business, the house, the property. I mean, no and I have plenty of money for college and everything, but we're not gonna be rich. If you have plenty of money for college and everything, you're rich. True. And dad doesn't owe us anything. I just wish he'd, you know, do the dad stuff. Take my brother to school in the morning, make sure he does his homework, not disappear in the middle of the night to escape prosecution, etc. I'm sorry. You say that a lot. I feel it a lot. He looked up at me. Have you ever been in love, Aza? No. You? No. He glanced down at my plate, then said, Okay, if neither of us is going to eat, we should probably go outside. Maybe we'll catch a break in the clouds. We put our coats back on and walked outside. It was a windy night, and I tucked my head into my chest as we walked, but when I glanced over at Davis, he was looking up. In the distance, I could see that two of the poolside recliners had been pulled out onto the golf course, near one of the flags marking a hole. The flag was whipping in the wind, and I could hear the white noise of traffic in the distance, but it was otherwise quiet, the cicadas and crickets silenced by the cold. We lay down on the loungers, next to each other but not touching, and looked up at the sky for a while. Well, this is disappointing, he said. But it's still happening, right? Like, there is still a meteor shower. We just can't see it. Correct, he said. So, what would it look like? I asked. Huh? If it weren't cloudy, what would I be seeing? Well. He took his phone out and opened it up to some stargazing app. So, over here in the northern sky is the constellation Draco, he said, which to me looks more like a kite than a dragon, but anyway, there would be meteors visible around here. There's not much moon tonight, so you could probably see five or ten meteors an hour. Basically, we're moving through dust left behind by this comet called Jacobini Zinner, and it would be super beautiful and romantic if only we did not live in gloomy Indiana. It is super beautiful and romantic, I said. We just can't see it. I thought about him asking me if I'd ever been in love. It's a weird phrase in English, in love, like it's a sea you drown in or a town you live in. You don't get to be in anything else, in friendship or in anger or in hope. All you can be in is love. And I wanted to tell him that even though I'd never been in love, I knew what it was like to be in a feeling, to be not just surrounded by it but also permeated by it, the way my grandmother talked about God being everywhere. When my thoughts spiraled, I was in the spiral, and of it. And I wanted to tell him that the idea of being in a feeling gave language to something I couldn't describe before, created a form for it, but I couldn't figure out how to say any of that out loud. I can't tell if this is a regular silence or an awkward silence, Davis said. What gets me about that poem, The Second Coming? 
You know how it talks about the widening spiral? The widening gyre. He corrected me. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. Right. Whatever. The widening gyre. But the really scary thing is not turning and turning in the widening gyre. It's turning and turning in the tightening gyre. It's getting sucked into a whirlpool that shrinks and shrinks and shrinks your world until you're just spinning without moving, stuck inside a prison cell that is exactly the size of you, until eventually you realize that you're not actually in a prison cell. You are the prison cell. You should write a response, he said. To Yates. I'm not a poet, I said. You talk like one, he said. Write down half the stuff you say and it would be a better poem than I've ever written. You write poetry. Not really. Nothing good. Like what? I asked. It was so much easier to talk to him in the dark, looking at the same sky instead of at each other. It felt like we didn't have bodies, like we were just voices talking. If I ever write something I'm proud of, I'll let you read it. I like bad poetry, I said. Please don't make me share my dumb poems with you. Reading someone's poetry is like seeing them naked. So I'm basically saying I want to see you naked, I said. They're just stupid little things. I want to hear one. Okay, like, last year I wrote one called, Last Ducks of Autumn. And it goes. The leaves are gone, you should be, too, I'd be gone if I were you. But then again, here I am, walking alone, in the frigid dawn. I quite like that, I said. I like short poems with weird rhyme schemes, because that's what life is like. That's what life is like. I was trying to get his meaning. Yeah. It rhymes, but not in the way you expect. I looked over at him. I suddenly wanted Davis badly enough that I no longer cared why I wanted him, whether what wanted him was capitalized or lowercase. I reached over, touched his cold cheek with my cold hand, and began to kiss him. When we came up for air, I felt his hands on my waist, and he said, I, ah, uh, wow. I smirked at him. I liked feeling his body against mine, one of his hands tracing my spine. Got any other poems? I've been trying to write just couplets lately. Like, nature stuff. Like, the daffodil knows more of spring, than roses know of anything. Yup, that works, too, I said, and kissed him again. I felt my chest tighten, his cold lips and warm mouth, his hands pulling me closer to him through the layers of our coats. I liked making out with so many layers on. Our breathing steamed up his glasses as we kissed, and he tried to take them off, but I pressed them up the bridge of his nose, and we were laughing together, and then he started kissing my neck, and a thought occurred to me. His tongue had been in my mouth. I told myself to be in this moment, to let myself feel his warmth on my skin, but now his tongue was on my neck, wet and alive and microbial, and his hand was sneaking under my jacket, his cold fingers against my bare skin. It's fine you're fine just kiss him you need to check something it's fine just be fucking normal check to see if his microbes stay in you billions of people kiss and don't die just make sure his microbes aren't going to permanently colonize you come on please stop this he could have campylobacter he could be a non-symptomatic E. coli carrier get that and you'll need antibiotics and then you'll get C. diff and boom dead in 4 days please fucking stop just kiss him just check to make sure. I pulled away. You okay? He asked. I nodded. I just, just need a little air. I sat up, turned away from him, pulled out my phone, and searched, do bacteria of people you kiss stay inside your body, and quickly scrolled through a couple pseudoscience results before getting to the one actual study done on the subject. 
Around 80 million microbes are exchanged on average per kiss, and, after six-month follow-up, human gut microbiomes appear to be modestly but consistently altered. His bacteria would be in me forever, 80 million of them, breeding and growing and joining my bacteria and producing God knows what. I felt his hand on my shoulder. I spun around and squirmed away from him. My breath running away from me. Dots in my vision. You're fine he's not even the first boy you've kissed 80 million organisms in me forever calm down permanently altering the microbiome this is not rational you need to do something please there is a fix here please get to a bathroom. What's wrong? Ah, uh, nothing, I said. I, um, just need to use the restroom. I pulled my phone back out to reread the study but resisted the urge, clicked it shut and slid it back into my pocket. But no, I had to check to see if it had said modestly altered or moderately altered. I pulled out my phone again, and brought up the study. Modestly. Okay. Modestly is better than moderately. But consistently. Shit. I felt nauseated and disgusting, but also pathetic. I knew how I looked to him. I knew that my crazy was no longer a quirk, a simple matter of a cracked finger pad. Now, it was an irritation, like it was to Daisy, like it was to anyone who got close to me. I was cold, but started to sweat anyway. I zipped my jacket up to my chin as I walked toward the house. I didn't want to run, but every second counted. Needed to get to a bathroom. Davis opened the back door for me and pointed me down a hallway toward a guest bathroom. I closed the door and locked it, shutting myself inside, and leaned against the countertop. I unzipped my jacket and stared at myself in the mirror. I took off the band-aid, opened up the cut with my thumbnail, then washed my hands and put on a new band-aid. I looked in the drawers beneath the sink for some mouthwash, but they didn't have any, so in the end, I just swished cold water around in my mouth and spit it out. There, are we good? I asked myself, and I responded, one more time to make sure, and so I swished and gargled more water, spit it out. I patted my sweaty face dry with some toilet paper and walked back into the golden light of Davis's mansion. He motioned for me to sit down, and put his arm around me. I didn't want his microbiota near me, but I let him keep his arm there, because I didn't want to seem like a freak. Are you okay? Yeah. Just, like, a little panicky. Was it something that I did? Should I do? No, it's not about you. You can tell me. It's really not. I. Just. Kissing freaked me out a little, I guess. Okay, so no kissing yet. That's no problem. It will be, I said. I have these. Thought spirals, and I can't get out of them. Turning and turning in the tightening gyre, he said. I'm. This, like. This doesn't get better. You should know that. I'm not in a rush. I leaned forward, looking at the hardwood floor. I'm not gonna unhave this is what I mean. I've had it since I can remember and it's not getting better and I can't have a normal life if I can't kiss someone without freaking out. It's okay, Aza. Really? You might think that now, but you won't think that forever. But it's not forever, he said. It's now. Can I get you anything? Glass of water or something? Can we? Can we just watch a movie or something? Yes, he said. Absolutely. He offered me his hand, but I got up on my own. As we walked toward the basement steps, Davis said, Here at the Pickett residence, we have both kinds of movies, Star Wars and Star Trek. 
What would you prefer? I'm not really a fan of space movies, I said. Great. Then we'll watch Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, 40% of which is set right here on Earth. I looked up at him and smiled, but I could not cinch a lasso on my thoughts, which were galloping all around my brain. We walked down to the basement, where I tapped the F. Scott Fitzgerald novel to make the bookcase open. I sat down in one of the overstuffed leather recliners, grateful for the armrests between the seats. Davis appeared after a while with a drive pepper, placed it in the cup holder by my armrest, and sat down next to me. How do you manage to be best friends with Daisy without liking space operas? I'll watch them with her. I just don't love them, I said. He's trying to treat you like you're normal and you're trying to respond like you're normal, but everyone involved knows you are definitely not normal. Normal people can kiss if they want to kiss. Normal people don't sweat like you. Normal people choose their thoughts like they choose what to watch on TV. Everyone in this conversation knows you're a freak. Have you read her FIC? I read a couple stories when she first started in middle school. They're not really my thing. I could feel the sweat glands opening on my upper lip. She's a pretty good writer. You should read them. You're actually kind of in some of them. Yeah, okay, I said quietly, and then at last he pulled out his phone and used an app to start the movie. I pretended to watch while settling all the way into the spiral. I kept thinking about that Pettibon painting, with its multicolored whirlpool, pulling your eye into the center of it. I tried to breathe in the Dr. Singh-sanctioned way without making it too obvious, but within a few minutes I was sweating in earnest, and he definitely noticed, because he'd seen this movie a hundred times, so really he was only watching it to watch me watch it, and I could feel his glances over at me. And even though I had my jacket zipped, he obviously had noticed the mad, wet mustache on my sopping upper lip. I could feel the tension in the air, and I knew he was trying to figure out how to make me happy again. His brain was spinning right alongside mine. I couldn't make myself happy, but I could make people around me miserable. When the movie ended, I told him I was tired because that seemed the adjective most likely to get me where I needed to be, alone and in my bed. Davis drove me home, walked me to the door, and kissed me chastely on my sweaty lips. As I stood on my doormat, I waved at him. He backed out of the driveway, and then I went into the garage, opened Harold's trunk, and grabbed my dad's phone, because I felt like looking at his pictures. I snuck past mom who was asleep on the couch in front of the TV. I found an old wall charger in my desk, plugged in Dad's phone, and sat there for a long time swiping through his photos, scrolling through all the pictures of the sky split open by tree branches. You know we've got those on the computer, Mom said gently from behind me. I hadn't heard her get up. Yeah, I said. I unplugged the phone and shut it off. Were you talking to him? Kinda, I said. What were you telling him? I smiled. Secrets. Ah, I tell him secrets, too. He's good at keeping them. The best, I said. Aza, I'm very sorry if I hurt Davis's feelings. And I've written him an apology note as well. I took it too far. But I also need you to understand. I waved her away. It's fine. Listen, I gotta change. I grabbed clothes and then went to the bathroom, where I undressed, toweled off the sweat, and then let my body cool down in the air, my feet cold against the floor. I untied my hair, then stared at myself in the mirror. I hated my body. It disgusted me, its hair, its pinpricks of sweat, its scrawniness. Skin pulled over a skeleton, an animated corpse. 
I wanted out. Out of my body, out of my thoughts, out. But I was stuck inside of this thing, just like all the bacteria colonizing me. Knock on the door. I'm changing, I said. I pulled on sweatpants and an old t-shirt of my mom's, and emerged from the bathroom, where mom was waiting for me. You feeling anxious? She said askingly. I'm fine, I answered, and turned toward my room. I turned out the lights and got into bed. I wasn't tired, exactly, but I wasn't feeling too keen on consciousness, either. When mom came in, a few minutes later, I pretended to be asleep so I wouldn't have to talk to her. She stood above me, singing this old song she'd sung whenever I couldn't sleep, as far back as I could remember. It's a song soldiers in England used to sing to the tune of the New Year's song, Auld Lang Syne. It goes, we're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. Her pitch rose through the first half like a deep breath in, and then she sang it back down. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. Even though I was supposed to be basically grown up and my mother annoyed the hell out of me, I couldn't stop thinking until her lull of 13. Despite my having psychologically decompensated in his presence, Davis texted me the next morning before I even got out of bed. Him, want to watch a movie tonight? Doesn't even have to be set in space. Me, I can't. Another time maybe. Sorry I freaked out and for the sweating and everything. Him, you don't even sweat an unnormal amount. Me, I definitely do but I don't want to talk about it. Him, you really don't like your body. Me, true. Him, I like it. It's a good body. I enjoyed being with him more in this non-physical space, but I also felt the need to board up the windows of myself. Me. I feel kinda precarious in general, and I can't really date you. Or date anyone. I'm sorry but I can't. I like you, but I can't date you. Him. We agree on that. Too much work. All people in relationships ever do is talk about their relationship status. It's like a Ferris wheel. Me, huh? Him. When you're on a Ferris wheel all anyone ever talks about is being on the Ferris wheel and the view from the Ferris wheel and whether the Ferris wheel is scary and how many more times it will go around. Dating is like that. Nobody who's doing it ever talks about anything else. I have no interest in dating. Me. Well, what do you have an interest in? Him. You. Me. I don't know how to respond to that. Him. You don't need to. Have a good day, Aza. Me. You too, Davis. I had an appointment with Dr. Karen Singh the next day after school. I sat on the love seat across from her and looked up at that picture of a man holding Annette. I stared at the picture while we talked because the relentlessness of Dr. Singh's eye contact was a little much for me. How have you been? Not great. What's going on? She asked. In my peripheral vision, I could see her legs crossed, black short-heeled shoes, her foot tapping in the air. There's this boy, I said. And? I don't know. He's cute and smart and I like him, but I'm not getting any better, and I just feel like if this can't make me happy, then what can? I don't know. What can? I groaned. That's such a psychiatrist move. Point taken. A change in personal circumstances, even a positive one, can trigger anxiety. 
so it wouldn't be uncommon to feel anxious as you develop a new relationship. Where are you with the intrusive thoughts? Well, yesterday I was making out with him and had to stop everything because I couldn't stop thinking about how gross it was, so not great. About how gross what was? Just how his tongue has its own particular microbiome and once he sticks his tongue in my mouth his bacteria become part of my microbiome for literally the rest of my life. Like, his tongue will sort of always be in my mouth until I'm dead, and then his tongue microbes will eat my corpse. And that made you want to stop kissing him. Well, yeah, I said. That's not uncommon. So part of you wanted to be kissing him and another part of you felt the intense worry that comes with being intimate with someone. Right, but I wasn't worried about intimacy. I was worried about microbial exchange. Well, your worry expressed itself as being about microbial exchange. I just groaned at the therapy bullshit. She asked me if I'd taken my Ativan. I told her I hadn't brought it to Davis's house. And then she asked me if I was taking the Lexapro every day. And I was, like, not every day. The conversation devolved into her telling me that medication only works if you take it, and that I had to treat my health problem with consistency and care, and me trying to explain that there is something intensely weird and upsetting about the notion that you can only become yourself by ingesting a medication that changes yourself. When the conversation paused for a moment, I asked, Why'd you put up that picture? Of that guy with the netting. What aren't you saying? What are you scared to say, Aza? I thought about the real question, the one that remained constantly in the background of my consciousness like a ringing in the ears. I was embarrassed of it, but also I felt like saying it might be dangerous somehow. Like how you don't ever say Voldemort's name. I think I might be a fiction, I said. How's that? Like, you say it's stressful to have a change in circumstances, right? She nodded. But what I want to know is, is there a you independent of circumstances? Is there a way down deep me who is an actual, real person? The same person if she has money or not. The same person if she has a boyfriend or not. The same if she goes to this school or that school. Or am I only a set of circumstances? I don't follow how that would make you fictional. I mean, I don't control my thoughts, so they're not really mine. I don't decide if I'm sweating or get cancer or C. diff or whatever, so my body isn't really mine. I don't decide any of that, outside forces do. I'm a story they're telling. I am circumstances. She nodded. Can you apprehend these outside forces? No, I'm not hallucinating, I said. It's like, I'm just not sure that I am, strictly speaking, real. Dr. Singh placed her feet on the floor and leaned forward, her hands on her knees. That's very interesting, she said. Very interesting. I felt briefly proud to be, for a moment anyway, not not uncommon. It must be very scary, to feel that yourself might not be yours. Almost a kind of imprisonment? I nodded. There's a moment, she said, near the end of Ulysses when the character Molly Bloom appears to speak directly to the author. She says, Oh Jamesy let me up out of this. You're imprisoned within a self that doesn't feel wholly yours, like Molly Bloom. But also, to you that self often feels deeply contaminated. I nodded. But you give your thoughts too much power, Aza. Thoughts are only thoughts. They are not you. You do belong to yourself, even when your thoughts don't. 
But your thoughts are you. I think therefore I am, right? No, not really. A fuller formation of Descartes' philosophy would be dubito, ergo cogito, ergo sum. I doubt, therefore I think, therefore I am. Descartes wanted to know if you could really know that anything was real, but he believed his ability to doubt reality proved that, while it might not be real, he was. You are as real as anyone, and your doubts make you more real, not less. The moment I got back home, I could feel mom's nerves jangling about my visit with Dr. Singh, even though she was trying to be calm and normal. How was it? She asked, not looking back at me while grading tests on the couch. Good, I guess, I said. I want to apologize again for the way I spoke to Davis yesterday, she said. You have every right to be upset with me. I'm not, I said. But I want you to be cautious, Aza. I can tell your anxiety is increasing, from your face to your fingertip. I balled up my hand and said, it's not him. What is it then? There's no reason, I said, and turned on the TV, but she took the remote and muted it. You seemed locked inside of your mind, and I can't know what's going on in there, and it scares me. I pressed my thumbnail against my fingertip through the band-aid, thinking it would scare her a lot more if she could see what was going on in there. I'm fine. Really? But you're not. Mom, tell me what to say. Seriously. Just. Tell me what words I can say to make you calm down about it. I don't want to calm down. I want you to stop being in pain. Well, that's not how it works, okay? I have to go read for history. I stood up, but before I could get to my room, she said, speaking of which, Mr. Myers told me today that your essay on the Columbian Exchange was the best he'd seen in all his years of teaching. He's been teaching like two years, I said. Four, but still, she said. You're going places, Aza Holmes. Big places. Did you ever hear of Amherst? I asked. Where? Amherst. It's this college in Massachusetts. It's really good. It's ranked really high. I think I might want to go there, if I get in. Mom started to say something but swallowed it, and then sighed. We'll just have to see where the scholarships come from. Or Sarah Lawrence, I said. That one seems good. Two. Well, remember, Aza, a lot of those schools charge you just to apply, so we have to be selective. The whole process is rigged, from start to finish. They make you pay to find out you can't afford to go. We need to be realistic, and realistically, you're going to be close to home, okay? And not only because of money. I don't think you really want to be halfway across the country from everything you know. Yeah, I said. Okay, I get it. You don't want to talk to your mother. I love you anyway. She blew me a kiss and at last I escaped to my room. I did have to read for history. But after I finished, I wasn't tired and I kept thinking about texting Davis. I knew what I wanted to write, or at least what I was thinking about writing. I couldn't stop thinking about the text, writing it out, hitting send knowing I couldn't take it back, the sweaty heart race of waiting for a reply. I turned off my light, rolled over onto my side, and shut my eyes, but I couldn't shake the thought, so I reached over for my phone clicked it awake, and wrote him.
When you said before that you like my body, what did you mean? I watched the screen for a few seconds, waiting for the of his reply to appear, but it didn't, so I put the phone back onto the bedside table. My brain was quiet now that I'd done the thing it wanted me to do, and I was nearly asleep when I heard the phone vibrate. Him. I mean I like it. Me. What about it? Him. I like the way your shoulders slope down into your collarbone. Him. And I like your legs. I like the curve of your calf. Him. I like your hands. I like your long fingers and the insides of your wrists, the color of the skin there, the veins underneath it. Me. I like your arms. Him. They're skinny. Me. They feel strong actually. Is this okay? Him. Very. Me. So, the curve of my calf? I never noticed it. Him. It's nice. Me. Is that it? Him. I like your ass. I really really like your ass. Is this okay? Me. Yes. Him. I want to start a fan blog about your ass. Me. Okay that's a little weird. Him. I want to write fan fiction in which your amazing butt falls in love with your beautiful eyes. Me. Lol. You are really ruining the moment. You were saying, before. Him. That I like your body. I like your stomach and your legs and your hair and I like. Your. Body. Me. Really? Him. Really. Me. What is wrong with me that texting is fun and kissing is scary?